it's, uh, it's, it does take some effort from all of us to be here, and I appreciate every time we do this, but we know the promise of a MEC talk is something extraordinary. We get insights into our grantees, what they're up to, what they've been doing since we've read all their applications. And this afternoon, we are very happy to welcome Evelyn and Oba, and we're going to start off right away. Um, what each of you can answer uh, as you feel ready to, or but perhaps let's, let's just say we start with you. Uh, do you mind sharing with us what triggered this idea of that women needs to have be, needs to be looked after in a workplace, but specifically in the mining field, which is very, very unique? If you care to share that with us, Oba, it'll be wonderful to hear from you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, so for me, I think that the trigger really started from my childhood because I grew up in a mining town. So there are narratives about what men and women do within that space. And so, for example, when it came to access to facilities, Usually the default question will be, what's your dad's agreement number? So that is just to say, who's the link to the organization and in terms of the facilities that you're accessing. And so for us growing up, it was almost always going to be the default. What's your dad's agreement number? But as time went by, we did see a few women moving from or let's see, we, we started seeing a few more women doing mining itself, so hardcore mining, rather than, you know, what I was used to, usually in um, the offices as support staff. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's just because of what was the norm back then. And so I do re recall this incident. I had gone to the library and I'd gone to my dad's office and there was this sensation because one woman had become a certified blaster and had gone underground. And it was such a big news in the town. It was in the news. Everybody was talking about it. And I remember one of his colleagues remarked in the local language that this woman is like unto a man. So just the fact that she's been able to you know, acquire this kind of certification and um, being able to do a man's job you know, had hair being equated to being a man. So these kind of narratives were very much um, sort of stuck with me, but then in ways that I really didn't sort of engage with until I started working. Although I didn't work in the mining field, um, I started off as a teaching and research assistant. And so seeing that even with the female lecturers that I worked with, most of them had their part, their spouses also as university lecturers. But what was interesting was that almost every time after school, the children will come to the department, to the mother's side, um, to you know wait on them and you know play games and whatnot. For me, what stood out was the fact that both parents were in the same university, the same campus, but almost as default, it was the mom who had to always rush to pick them and sort of keep them until they are done with um, their research duties and then um, go home. So very unique sort of experiences at certain point sort of shaped this interest in wanting to research about women and the place of work. So in as much as yes, I sort of had an idea of what I wanted to do it was really until I started listening to the kinds of conversations that go on in the workplace that was really after my master's degree where I really sort of solidified this idea that this is what I'd like to um, research into. And the last point that I'll make was also with the kinds of, again, narratives that go with women who are fierce in the workplace and how they're perceived by their colleagues. So I remember at a point I toyed with the idea of venturing into politics in Ghana. I didn't go ahead with it anyway, but I remember that for women who were more fierce and you know could stand up to their male colleagues, 
the kinds of narratives that sort of define them were usually not very positive. And for me, I thought that was also a bit of a disconnect that if we call this a rough terrain, then we actually expect, you know, people who are tough. But when women were tough and being competitive, the labels that were assigned them were really not um, what you would expect. And so I think for me, these and various other um, experiences shaped this kind of interest. Yeah, maybe I'd leave it here. Thanks. No, that, that, that's a very personal experience you had. It's not just a theory. Um, Evelyn? Would you like to share in either English or Spanish what what made you to see that see this problem and what triggered it and why why did you pursue it? Okay, thanks. Um, I would like to 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 share with you uh, a part of English and Spanish at the finish. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Potosí, my home, my homeland, is linked to the mining industry since the 16th century. Potosí was the main silver mine of Spanish America in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I'm so interested in exploring how women were key actors of their industry in the colonial and modern times. Okay. Um, in Potosí society, there is a discourse of glorification uh, of the silver age, silencing uh, the role of women. And my purpose is to make visible um, their females and highlight their significant uh, participation in silver and tin industri industries. On the other hand, um, I believe that the history of Potosino females is still a neglected topic in the Bolivian historiographic. Uh, that's, that's it about my work. Uh -huh. No, that, that's lovely how you got into it with the whole history. Did you have somebody in the family who actually worked in these mines? And yes. Uh, I prefer to to come to share with you in Spanish this part. Uh, it's fine. Okay. You did very well. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, bueno, yo 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 soy potosina. He nacido acá. Eh, tengo 35 años y vengo de de una familia minera. Varios integrantes de mi familia eh, han estado en la explotación eh, minera del Cerro Rico de Potosí, ¿no? Many, many of her family members have been involved in uh, as minors in Potosí. Okay. Eh, no necesariamente, la mayoría de hecho han sido los los participantes de mi familia han sido hombres. Sin embargo, ya explorando un poco mi árbol genealógico también he encontrado la participación de muchas mujeres. Entonces, a mí me ha, me ha sorprendido mucho que que desde niña eh, nos mostraban este discurso eh, glorioso, digamos, de la riqueza, de la plata, la identidad de la minería. Sin embargo, en todas estas narrativas construidas eh, ha sido eh, prácticamente invisibilizado toda la precariedad también que existe detrás de la explotación minera. Por ese motivo... Eh, most, most, perdón, most, most of, the, of her family members who have been involved as minors have been men. But doing some genealogic research, she found out that there have been women involved as well. And uh, furthering that research, she discovered that many of the precarious situations have been ignored or not sufficiently mentioned. Y es así que he empezado a explorar un poco más en la industria minera. Eh, específicamente el 2017 eh, cofundé una organización que se llama Mujer de Plata. Ahí tuve contacto directo con las mujeres mineras del Cerro Rico de Potosí. Y es ahí donde me ha impresionado mucho los testimonios que tienen estas mujeres mineras de diferentes categorías. ¿no? Trabajan al interior mina, también al exterior con mineral de desmonte. Y es ahí donde yo eh, dije, esto se tiene que documentar, porque creo que hay otras narrativas, hay otras miradas para poder comprender la historia de Potosí y la historia de Bolivia fuera de este discurso de riqueza, entre comillas, riqueza eh, minera, eh, sino más bien creo que la riqueza está en, en las voces de estas mujeres, ¿no? Uh -huh. So in 2017, she founded an organization called Mujer de Plata, which is Silver Woman. 
and she got in contact with women who are working inside and outside the mine, unloading the minerals. She discovered how these voices have been largely ignored, and she decided to uh, relate, to narrate the history of how the riches of her country are not only in the mine, but in the people who are working there. Very unique and special. Thank you. And I think now it's time to introduce Priscilla, who's done the research, who actually discovered you like a diamond in a mine. And I think you can go from here and really get into the nitty gritty bit about the work you actually do. Uh, Priscilla, thank you so much for this. And we always love our MEG talks. I said it's always a re revelation every time we do it. Thanks, Priscilla. Hi, Over to welcome, you. welcome to our uh, wonderful grantees who've come to join us. Um, I, we already have kind of covered the question, how did you begin your work, which was the next question. So I'd like to move on to what is the main focus of your work? Uh, it's, a, it's a very big and general uh, field that you've uh, involved yourselves in. And I think it would be very interesting to know if you have a particular area or focus uh, that you'd like to share with us. Thank you. So we start with Evelyn, you can start, start. With Evelyn this time since we since we started with Oba the last time. Evelyn, eh, yo creo que si quieres leer eh, la respuesta que tenías preparada para la pregunta 3, está muy bien. Gracias. Sí, la voy a leer y después sí la puedo complementar. Um, my research studies the experience of role of, of mining women in Potosí between uh, 1975 and 2021, 22. Uh, this, this study explores their organization, identity, and memory. A mining world is usually, usually seen as a masculine environment. Uh, Potosino mining women participate in destruction, in destruction, supervision, and circulation of minerals. They are part of the mining complex. In addition, they have created an ideological and social universe, uh, which strengthens string the, the collective identity. I explore the social mining memory from a fe feminist perspective. Their inter interpretation of the past and festivals have forget their social memory. Finally, a mining women uh, elaborated a discourse about the dignity of the labor. Uh, esa es mi respuesta más o menos en inglés. Uh, esto justamente quisiera complementar un poquito uh, para que se pueda entender más. Eh, mi, mi investigación justamente trata de rescatar y dialogar con, las, con los testimonios de las, de las mujeres mineras para que se pueda eh, ver estas otras narrativas fuera de la industria minera, porque la experiencia que tienen las mujeres en el Cerro Rico creo que son muy valiosas y esto también lo he tratado de complementar con los archivos de la Casa Nacional de Moneda y también el archivo de, de la Comibol, ¿no? que, es, que son, son archivos que más o menos eh, datan de, desde los 70 hasta ahora para poder compararlos también en tiempo y en espacio. ¿no? So, so Evelyn has been very interested in dialogue with these mining women in uh, recovering all their memories and sharing with the public so that people know that this is not only uh, an industry where men are involved. She has used archives from the National House of Casa Nacional de Moneda. Uh, sí. yeah. So it's like the Mint, the, the Mint, they have archives. Y dijiste otro archivo? Archivo Nacional de Minería de la Comibol. Okay, a, a mining archive, and she has records dating back to the 70s, where she can see the experiences and she can compare the experiences throughout the years of these women. Es, son experiencias de mujeres y hombres. No, principalmente mi trabajo se, se concentra en el testimonio de las mujeres mineras. Sí, Main, mainly mining women. Oh, Bud, you have, um, we'd love to hear your focus and maybe you have something you'd like to share with Evelyn 
uh, to compare maybe your experience with Evelyn's experience. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So, indeed, my study was on women in male dominated jobs within male dominated industries and how they are able to become upwardly mobile. So, just a bit of background. So, what I realized was that there was enough studies on the challenges women face in male dominated industries. And so, I wanted to understand. Despite all these challenges, we are also seeing that the numbers are statistically, at least speaking, are increasing. And so, um, for such women, how do they thrive? So, what are the things that they do at the individual level? So, I use the psychological concept called identity work at the individual level to understand what they also do um, to help them become um, upwardly mobile or thrive in the workplace. I also looked at the systems and also the networks are the are the workplace that then supports their growth as well. So what I did was to also explore um, male colleagues, particularly and um, the organizational systems that allowed them to become upwardly mobile. Now, my study was situated in South Africa and focused on mining and logistics. So I had logistics as well. Um, so I did more of a qualitative study um, interviews mainly, and I also complemented that with organizational policies just to see what organizations commit to and what they actually do in practice. So um, to understand what they're doing now. But I think the beauty of Evelyn's work is also to understand how things have also evolved, I guess. Um, so that I think is also a very interesting angle to take, but um, that's the focus that my study took. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Madeline, were you going to ask the next question? I'm fine with that, but <clears throat> so let's let's see the goal put your, your, you gave yourself for doing this study and what was the goal that you hoped the uh, result would have been? Or could you see that there was, by just doing the study, that there were different results? Or did you get a lot of resistance in your study? So would you like to share that with us? Oh, well, you can you can carry on now. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> in terms of expectations, um, well, I think for me, what I didn't realize from the get go was the fact that um, what it's what is called um, you know the silver um, the glass ceiling, the sticky floor, and similar concepts can be either actual or perceived. So I think for me, that was um, something that I came across that I wasn't quite, um, that I didn't set out to um, sort of find out. What I realized was that sometimes, of course, due to structural issues, especially within um, certain societies where traditional rules still persist, we still do see that structurally some of these um, ways that we perceive the roles of women, women's competence, for example, spill over to the workplace. Beyond that, some of the limitations are also at the individual level. So, for example, how women also perceive their own competence, right? Um, some will, for example, not take the initiative because they feel they are not adequately, you know, prepared to take on a higher role. Whereas their male colleagues with most often than not um, lower uh, qualifications or sometimes, um, should I say limited experience, will have the courage to actually go in to take on those um, bigger roles. So that was something that I realized and I could sort of make that distinction between what was perceived and what was actual. And I think I got, I was able to make that connection because I also spoke to their colleagues and I could see how sometimes women perceive themselves as, oh, I'm still growing in the field. And you talk to, um, you know, one of their colleagues and they'll tell you that this lady is brilliant. You know, she's ready for the next role. So I could make that kind of connections just based on talking to these individuals and how they, you know, perceive um, competence and experience differently. 
So I think that was quite unique um, in terms of what I saw from talking to these different groups. What I think also surprised me was how in very subtle ways, organizations sort of communicate, we are looking for a man. So um, in terms of the ways that advertisements are placed or the types of expectations that come with certain roles, it's usually a role couched for, for the lack of a better word, a man who is unmarried and has no children, you know. So for such women who have domestic duties and unfortunately, not unfortunately, I realized that quite a number of my female participants were single mothers. And so the duties were a bit more, um, should I say pronounced as compared to their colleagues who had spouses or partners. So for them, the layer of, you know, burden in terms of domestic duties and care responsibilities also impacted the way then they are able to engage in the workplace. And I think one quote from one of the participants, which was a colleague at the workplace who pointed this out was that sometimes some of the um, senior colleagues will go like, um, call. so they have this apprenticeship sort of arrangement in the organization and someone would actually request, I would like Tom, I would like Sam. So then invariably you can see that then the men's experience and exposure keep increasing as compared to the women. So in very subtle ways, we also do see that then such women do not have that kind of exposure to be able to then um, become upwardly mobile. So I think some of these experiences were quite unique in terms of what I didn't expect um, to come across and what um, I also found out throughout the study. Yeah. Thanks, Ora. Evelyn, what were your surprises? <laughs> Ah, gracias. Eh, esta vez lo voy a contestar en español esta, esta, esta pregunta. Eh, creo que es importante el, el objetivo del trabajo que, que he estado realizando, que no, que por supuesto todavía voy a continuar con ello, pero creo que la clave está en la resignificación de, de la historia a través de la memoria histórica de las mujeres mineras. Eh, conociendo estas memorias y también documentando estos testimonios y haciendo una comparación con lo que es el archivo, eh, el archivo histórico, creo que nos permite un poco comparar cómo ha ido evolucionando el mundo minero a través de la vida de las familias, principalmente las mujeres mineras en Potosí. ¿No? Y con eso, ¿qué es lo que se pretende hacer? Como yo también estoy ligada a lo que es el activismo y el trabajo organizacional, uno de la, una de las metas es proponer políticas públicas para poder dignificar mucho más el trabajo de las mujeres mineras. Uno de los principales problemas, por ejemplo, que he podido identificar es la cuestión de, de la informalidad que tienen las mujeres mineras en estos trabajos, no todas, por supuesto, pero la mayoría sí, eh, tienen una, una informalidad en la conexión con, con las cooperativas mineras principalmente. ¿no? Entonces, a ver, un momentito. De... Ajá. Evelyn, so, este so part, part, of her, part of her project, which she will continue, is to revindicate the history of these women, their histories who have been ignored or have not been mentioned. Uh, she has discovered through her research where she is seeing the evolution of these jobs throughout the decades. Uh, the role of women and she wants to revindicate their history which has not been mentioned or divulged as much as the history of ma minor men uh, she has discovered through her research and she's surprised by the fact that the relationship between these minor women and the collectives or the mining companies themselves is very informal uh, para los hombres también es informal la relación Yes. And no, no, no en todos los casos, pero en una gran mayoría sí. Pero en el caso okay, de las pero... mujeres mineras, eh, sufren además múltiples jornadas laborales. Eh, una está, por ejemplo, ligada a lo que es con el trabajo minero, otras están al cuidado de las familias y otras, muchas veces también con el comercio informal. Entonces ah, creo okay. que ellas, a diferencia de los hombres, cumplen estas múltiples jornadas. ¿no? Y lo que pretendo hacer con el trabajo, eh, continuar con este trabajo, es que en un mediano plazo poder proyectar algunas políticas públicas que sean eh, también eh, promovidas desde la sociedad civil. Muy bien. 
So it's mostly, even though there are cases where men's relationship is informal, it's mostly in the cases of women that these relationships are informal. And of course, uh, she discovers that women have several roles or several jobs to do, not just in the mine, but in the family, and sometimes in inform other informal jobs as well. Uh, part of the purpose of her research is also to propose public policies where they can address the situation of the minor women. And uh, de las políticas públicas, me dices que es para relatar la situación de las mujeres. Sí, con una proyección para una mejora de, de, de los trabajos ¿no? que ellas tienen. To uh, promote uh, an improvement in the type of jobs that these women have. Gracias. Um, thank you. That's, thank you. I think very, Priscilla... very interesting, very interesting uh, comparison between the two, the two um, ways of being involved. Um, the question I have is, what are the greatest challenges uh, to your work? Uh, what, what kinds of barriers or opposition do you face, whether it's formal, uh, even, you know, from, say, the government or informal from just general opinion, people not wanting to support you, or maybe you don't have any challenges and you feel, you know, you can just move ahead. And again, I would really like to encourage um, Evelyn and Oba to talk to each other if they feel like it. Um, and if they don't, then we'll, preset, we'll proceed with the, the question and answer format. So thanks very much. And why don't we start with um, Oba? Well, um, so reflecting on this question, I, I mean, um, I think when I think about the challenges, I think of the fact that maybe I'm I'm still, you know, fresh out of PhD, so um, my head is still trying to figure out how to um, continue in this line of, um, you know, uh, line of research so i'm still very much working in that space so i haven't necessarily come again come across any opposition or any challenge but i think for me um where i find myself currently as now a mother and one who has a child i mean when i started the phd that wasn't the situation so i think i'm sort of beginning to understand why women make certain decisions particularly from my participants. So I think for me, the it's sort of made me understand certain things for myself, but in terms of um, work-related stuff, I think that I'm yet to face any um, challenge in that regard. But maybe I could also um, learn from Evelyn um, in this regard, yeah. Evelyn, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, thanks. I wanted to, to continue the studies of mining women as well as uh, develop social projects. In Potosi, the main social, social challenge are the naturalization of inequality, gender biases and uh, extractivism. The rem removal of natural resource is seen as the main uh, vehicle for an economic development and uh, mining industry affect the environment and the social conditions of mine workers and uh, are still uh, precarious. With respect to my own work, the conservative social discourse of women of their right is a challenge for rethinking re the ways to foster a feminist agent. Studies of women's past and present are an invitation to construct alternative spaces uh, for females. Uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. I was just wondering, um, because, you know, we, and I'm not so sure about where Evelyn's minds are, but I think, Oba, if you did your research here in South Africa, the, the big mining, I know there's a lot of informal mining, which we rather would like to ignore because I think it's very dangerous, but the big mining companies, do you see 
a social outreach, a community outreach. Would you th would you say the mind, although we're not he's not talking about the as per se the the employee, the woman employee, because this is the person you researched. But would you think, or would did you come across that that they do have a community outreach in for the children or for in the educational side at the schools? And um, how did you? The companies participate in the community. Evelyn, the same for you. You know, in the community, do the minds care for the community? Are they receptive of ideas? Do they share their their profits, or you know, to up to keep the community good? Well, but I think you you not nodded very well, yeah. very seriously. <laughs> so I think you can start. <laughs> yeah, sure. Indeed. Um... Well, so for my study, I didn't explore too much around the issue of um, corporate social responsibility, for example, but I do remember one of the one of the participant women employees saying that she was actually in fact to so one of them received a bursary from the one of the companies. So she's more or less a product that was groomed from the university. So um, that was almost like a plowback mechanism of a sort because for her, um, she really didn't know that she could have um, a career in mining until the company went to the university. I think she was doing um, one of, I can't remember exactly, but she made a switch and received the bursary and then now works there. One of them also talked about um, also being a recipient of again another type of bursary but it was community level so then she then received that bursary and then went in for training so um although that was not necessarily a point that i explored i did see that at least two of the participants had benefited from some of the interventions from the companies and i do remember one of them talking very fondly about how they sold the, the idea of, you know, mining to them in a way that really attracted them and caused them to make that switch. And I think that what's also beautiful about their journey is that they are also very much, um, you know, changing the narrative about career choices around male dominated jobs, male dominated industries. And so we do see almost like a a full circle moment for many of them. They're also going back to the communities, at least at their personal level. So yeah, that that's what I want. I would like to say, but I have a different experience based. Um, I think that's more personal experience based in the based on the Ghanaian experience. Yeah. Well, and what can you tell us about that? I mean, that's very good. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I mentioned, I grew up in a mining town, so. Um, in terms of the kinds of interventions that the organization took, it was, it ranged from a number of things. So I do remember, for example, um, conversations around conservation because the, um, the process had been quite exploitative. So they, there were conversations around how we could um, reclaim some of the land and make sure that at least it's still productive and not just um, remains bare land. There were conversations around that. Um, some also covered around education, particularly for girls, um, because we had a very unique situation where um, HIV was quite on the rise um, because there was a bit of, um, should I say, because we say money was circulating, so people were a bit more um quite carefree with the way they spent so um girls were not taking full advantage of edu um, the educational opportunities that were available so there were a lot of um campaigns for example um in my town around girl child education and education generally for um people who wanted to even find some form of career in their minds because i think initially the standards were a bit low when it came to education but i think with time people realized that they could actually formalize their skills and become a bit more um, upwardly mobile in that regard. So yeah, these are just the two I can immediately talk about from the Ghanaian context, yeah. But this is nice. So you've got a South African research, but you know what's happening in Ghana back home. Uh, Evelyn, 
your in the, the areas where you were have they woken up and seen a community service have they looked at environmental things so what did what has there been any change in that sense mining side the corporate side or is it window dressing would you like to translate that for me si. Vivian? i think it's been a bit vague yeah si. Uh, yes, I prefer to answer this question in Spanish, please. Um, bueno, la relación que, que existe, por ejemplo, con el trabajo minero, quienes se benefician de todo esto, en Bolivia, eh, por un lado están las empresas mineras, que son empresas grandes que pertenecen a las transnacionales, y por otro lado están las cooperativas mineras, que pertenecen a cooperativistas un poco más informales, se podría decir, que, eh, que sí están relacionados y cumpliendo, digamos, una normativa, pero que no cumplen a cabalidad eh, con las normas de trabajo minero, ¿no? So, so there, are two, there are two benefactors to the mining activity. One are the big transnational companies, and the other are the smaller, the cooperatives, who are linked in, in a certain way, but are not fully compliant with all the regulations that they should be following for these activities. Sí. Thanks, uh, Vivian. Um, las mujeres mineras a las que yo pude acceder eh, con todo el trabajo que he podido realizar, eh, todas las que he podido, con mm -hmm. las que he podido con conversar, pertenecen a las cooperativas mineras, ¿no? Las que son más informales. So all, all women miners are members of the cooperative, more informal. Eh, en este caso, por ejemplo, yo he podido identificar que la relación eh, y las categorías de trabajo de las mujeres mineras son diversas, ¿no? Algunas recogen mineral de desmonte, otras ingresan al interior mina, otras también son cooperativistas mineras y de esta forma se van relacionando y algunas tienen mucho más estatus, eh, digamos, social y otras eh, vienen, vienen a tener un poco el trabajo un poco más informal. No, entonces, so, so, eh, so women, these, these women miners, some uh, are able to go into the mine and others are outside the mine collecting the minerals. And this uh, has caused a different uh, stratification uh, among the women of uh, the power of, of these women within the organization. Sí, eh, a partir de, de, de esa categorización, la relación que tienen con las cooperativas mineras eh, Es, es bastante injusta, ¿no? En muchos casos, por ejemplo, esta informalidad o contrato simplemente um, no escrito, entonces pero hace que se vulneren mucho de los derechos laborales. Entonces, la mayoría de, de, la, de estas cooperativas, los que están inscritos en la cooperativa minera como socios cooperativistas, son quienes eh, tienen mayores beneficios. ¿no? durante todo el año, pero los que no están inscritos y muchas de ellas, muchas mujeres mineras, por ejemplo, un número aproximado que podría eh, decir de una cooperativa minera, hay 3,000 socios cooperativistas y apenas hay como 30 mujeres de, 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 esos, de ese número, ¿no? Entonces, okay, es muy, so, muy so, uh -huh. so she has discovered that uh, on top of all this uh, difference in, in terms of uh, power and rights of these women within the organization. She has discovered that uh, out of, for example, 3,000 members in one of these cooperatives, only 30 are women. And uh, the paying members of the cooperative will, of course, have their rights better protected than those, than those that don't. And to top it all off, many of these labor contracts are unwritten. There's nothing in writing. So the rights of these women are completely they're completely vulnerable. Sí, y a partir de esa clasificación eh, se puede observar, por ejemplo, que las mujeres mineras eh, muchas eh, logran tener ese sello, digamos, de socia cooperativista, ¿no? Porque además han sido la mayoría viudas de, de socios cooperativistas. Entonces, por eso es como que el enganche que se puede realizar para que tengan ese, ese cargo. Pero hablando ya de, lo, de, 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 de otro tipo, por ejemplo, que son las llampiras, las llampiras son mujeres que escogen el mineral de desmonte para que la carga pueda ser más pura. Y el otras desmonte, las... ¿El desmonte es afuera de la mina? Así es. Okay, se va, so se va some... y entonces eh, oh, ahí, ahí, ahí se, va, se va seleccionando el mineral, ¿no? Uh -huh. some, some of the women are able to join the cooperative once they become widows mm -hmm. and their husbands used to be paying members of the cooperatives. So that's how they are able to uh, have this relationship 
or more formal relationship with, with a co-op. Uh, and then there are other types of uh, jobs for these women who work outside the mine. And they are what, what she's calling this monte, which I understand is like the separation of the mineral from the rock. Uh, ¿Es esto correcto, Evelyn? ¿El desmonte es separar el mineral de la piedra? Sí, así es. Entonces, ellas, por ejemplo, trabajan por día, por jornadas, ¿no? Entonces, van recaudando el mineral, entonces le dan un porcentaje a la cooperativa, ¿no? Y eso si la cooperativa se lo permite. Otras formas de trabajo, por ejemplo, que también están relacionadas, y, y creo que es la, la que está en el eslabón mucho más bajo de, de toda una cooperativa, que son las serenas, que son las que cuidan las bocaminas, ¿no? Ok, so, so there's the, I'm sorry. Perdón. Uh, so there's this second category of women who are outside the mine separating the, the, the minerals from the rock. Uh, they're like in a second, uh, how would you say? Yeah. Thank you. Little. Thank you. They're in the second tier. And then there's still a third tier, the serenas, which is like the guards, the women who are guarding over the entrance to the mines. Okay. Evelyn, perdimos tu cámara. No sé si nos puedes ver. Eh, sí, sí, les puedo ver. Y, y yo también. Y mi video parece estar bien. Sí. Ay, ya no te vemos. Eh, qué extraño. Sí, está okay. prendida la cámara. Ok. Eh, pero, pero bueno, eh, ya terminando, digamos, un poco la idea, eh, creo que eh, una de, la, de las cosas que comentaba también, eh, la que, la que nos preguntó es sobre quiénes se benefician más. Entonces, creo que en esta jerarquización en el mundo minero, los de arriba, sean los socios cooperativistas, los dueños de las minas, son quienes mayor, eh, mayor proporción de ganancias tienen, ¿no? Y las mujeres, muy poquitas, son las que pueden tener eh, esas ganancias, ¿no? La mayoría están como que en los eslabones más, más bajos. Uh -huh. So, regarding the question of who benefits from all this mining work, it's basically the owners, the, the companies that are owners of the mines, and in the second place, the, the cooperatives who are uh, having all these miners enroll. And uh, in a very, very low tier, you would find the women who are basically not benefit, uh, benefited at all by, these, uh, by this work. Goodness. Uh, Priscilla, I think you can ask the... Sorry, Priscilla, I was just saying, I think if you could ask the last formal question and then the our audience can get their questions ready uh, or what, what they still need to know about our wonderful ladies. Okay, Priscilla, thanks. Thank you. Um, in, in English, we have a saying called baby steps, which means you, you, have, you take little steps towards your goal. And I was wondering um, what the goals were for the work that you're doing. Um, obviously, you know, complete equality and and uh, rights and uh, health care and things that would improve the lives of not only the women, but certainly everybody in the community. But I wondered if you had specific goals that were uh, that you were striving towards. And if so, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about them. Thank you. Uh, would you like to start, Oba, with this? Sure. Um, so I was hoping with the study that I will be able to um, bring a different view towards women's jobs, um, women doing male, male work, essentially, because as I mentioned, the focus had, had been on challenges. And so it was really to sort of take the spotlight of the challenges and let's see what else is happening within the space. And I think I managed to do that in the sense that um, I, I was able to engage on a topic that initially I realized a bit, a bit of hesitation to speak. But then after the conversation, I do realize that I get com um, comments such as, oh, this was actually quite nice to reflect on, you know, what I'm doing right, quote and unquote. And so I think that was a very good experience that I had in that regard. I think that also in terms of what the research also does is to also give men the opportunity to have a real look 
and a rethink about the way they engage with their colleagues, particularly who are women in the workplace. I think many of them indeed realize that it's not going to be business as usual going forward. Because I remember very well when one, one of them said, oh, when we started working here in the mine, we could just, you know, change anywhere. We could just do anything. We could just curse. And, you know, now we have to be a bit more cautious about the way we behave. So we do see that at least um, the presence of women are also changing the ways that um, the organizational culture in these organizations and um, not just, you know, changing it for changing its sake, but really adding something positive. So which for me was good. And I think that also for men realizing their roles as allies was also very important. And I think a lot of them really um, talked about the ways that they have supported their colleagues. I think many of them actually didn't realize how much they've done, but they also did so in, and I think many of them were also sort of trying not to be self-aggrandizing about it, you know, so um, they tried to make it all about their female colleagues, which I thought was quite refreshing. And I think that for HR um, officials that I also spoke to, having the results, so I, I shared with them the result, of course, not the academic, very academic version, but um, a more user-friendly version, if I can put it that way, for them to also see what they're also doing, what their policies are saying, how their um, colleagues are experiencing, um, you know, discrimination, diversity, inclusion, whatnot. And so for me, I think that um, these three levels that I was sort of aiming at, although I had a fourth level, but of course, because of Corona, I couldn't um, meet that, which was with the family. So the initial plan was to also engage family to see how they also come in and fit into this whole idea of helping women thrive in these um, working environments. So that notwithstanding, I think that these three levels for me, I think I managed to get through. And yeah, I think this will be um, some of the things that I'd like to highlight here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Evelyn, would you like to share uh, some of the goals that you have in mind for, say, in the next um, couple of years, what, you, what you'd like to uh, accomplish, if at all? possible if it's you have a, a great task ahead of you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, I prefer to answer this question in Spanish, please. Uh, it's more, it's better uh, for me. Um, algunas, uh, creo que para poder mejorar un poco uh, estas realidades, Creo que se tiene, y creo que esa es una apuesta que, que, que creo fielmente, es la investigación, ¿no? La investigación, eh, rescatando esta memoria de las mujeres y de los grupos subalternos para poder releernos y resignificar la historia de la región y, bueno, ¿por qué no decir también de mi país, no? A partir de esta resignificación creo que ya con documentación, con voces, eh, rescatando estas voces, estos testimonios, creo que se tiene que amplificar a la sociedad para que la sociedad también vea estas otras grietas de, las, de, de la historia boliviana y de la historia potosina, ¿no? A ver, un momentito. Y, so, so a big part of our purpose is to resignify all these histories, which have so far been ignored. She wants to bring them to light and she wants them to filter into society so that society is more aware of uh, the situations that all these women are living through. Gracias, Vivian, perdona. Eh, y bueno, a partir de esta resignificación de la historia, creo que ya una vez amplificando también eh, lo, que es, lo que se produce en las investigaciones desde las mujeres mineras, creo que se puede eh, apostar de cierta forma a una nueva conciencia social que pueda eh, ya no naturalizar la violencia y el trabajo precario de las mujeres y del mundo minero, porque el mundo minero cuando se lo lee en Bolivia al menos, eh, se lo lee desde esta riqueza, desde esta identidad y no se lee en estas otras partes que, que también produce eh, la explotación minera, por ejemplo, el medio ambiente, por ejemplo, claro. las precariedades, ¿no? Solamente se, claro. se ensalta eh, lo que es el patrimonio, por ejemplo, de la explotación eh, con el Cerro Rico de Potosí como un símbolo de identidad. Pero cuando Oops, una... Perdón, perdón. Persona, so, so she... Her... Part of our purpose is to resignify through these histories 
the conscience uh, also in terms of the environment of all the risks that the workers in the mines suffer and go through every day. Uh, she, she says that in Bolivia, uh, the Cerro of Potosí is a national symbol of all the riches of the country, but she wants to create social awareness that this uh, Cerro de Potosí also represents risks in, in the work of people who work there, both men and women. Sí. Sí, eh, eh, por ejemplo, el Cerro Rico de Potosí no solamente es un símbolo de identidad a nivel nacional, sino también ha sido declarado eh, como patrimonio de la humanidad, ¿no? Por la UNESCO. Sin embargo, cuando una se acerca a, la, a estas realidades, están presentes las desigualdades, están presente la contaminación minera, eh, está, está presente la explotación también del, a través del trabajo. ¿No? Entonces creo que, que estas cosas también tienen que salir, pero no solamente desde la investigación, sino también desde lo que es la representación de las mujeres mineras. Eh, y con esto termino, Vivian. Una de las cosas, por ejemplo, que a mí me ha sorprendido eh, es, que, eh, es que algo... Es la consolidación de organizaciones en el Cerro Rico de Mujeres. Por ejemplo, existe eh, un grupo que es el Sindicato de Mujeres eh, Serenas, ¿no? Eh, también están el sindicato de las mujeres palliris, que son okay. mujeres agrupadas que creo que pueden dar una voz más allá de lo que es eh, esto, estos discursos a nivel nacional, ¿no? Okay, so, so the Cerro of Potosí has been recognized by the UN uh, as a treasure, a world treasure, and she is meaning to make sure that the history is out there, that it's not only... Uh, a place of riches, as, as she had mentioned, but also a place of uh, risk and hard labor for these people. She has been surprised by the female organizations that she has discovered around the mining industry. One of them is the organization of the Serenas, who are the women who are in charge of looking after the entrance to the mines. La segunda organización, ¿cuál me dijiste que es? La Asociación de Mujeres Palliris. Palliris? Palliris. Son quienes eh, recogen también mineral de desmonte, ¿no? Ah, there's another organization of women who are dedicated to uh, picking apart the materials outside the mine. It's called, they're, they're called Palliris, ¿ok? Sí, dime más. Sí, entonces a partir de, de, de estas voces creo que se pueden cambiar porque ellas ya organizadas reclaman para que se cumplan los derechos que ya están conseguidos ¿no? en, en la normativa nacional. Y creo que ese sería un importante cambio, fortalecer estas instituciones y cambiar estas narrativas con esta resignificación histórica. ¿no? So these women who have organized themselves are being big players in bringing this to the public uh, discussion and promoting public policies to make uh, society aware and uh, women who have organized themselves are being uh, are, are being uh, change makers in her country to protect the women and men who are working in the mine. Okay. Sí, that, that's all. Thank you. Gracias, Thank you, that, that was a lot of revealing, and it's wonderful to see how at ground level the big changes can happen. I think if a group comes together and believes things do happen. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, Boba. And now I'm going to leave you, um, I'm going to ask the audience, so this is going to be a very interesting question. Um, if you have an experience of, my, of women in, in the labor force and, uh, and you would like to share it, you want and part of the audience, please feel free and um, let's let's hear from you and you can pose your question towards Oba or Evelyn. Anybody? I uh, don't see a little hand. Who would like to start off here? You're all in the labor force. There must be one question. Yes, Oba, you can ask ask a question. Yes. <laughs> So I'd like to ask um, Evelyn, um, so she talked about the cooperative and I'm just curious to find out whether um, your work also focused on um, whether it's a union of a sort within the big um, corporates that you studied, if that's the case, um, just because I missed that and I thought it was um, a very useful 
organization or body to look at, but I'm just wondering whether that was part of your focus and what were some of the um, learnings from that union, if yeah, you managed to get to that. Thanks. Okay, te, te pregunta Oba si parte de tu estudio ha estado centrado también en los sindicatos, si es el caso, hay sindicatos dentro de las compañías. De las cooperativas. Eh, eh, sí, eh, dentro de las cooperativas eh, desconozco, pero fuera de las cooperativas las mujeres se organizan, ¿no? Por ejemplo, recién el año pasado, no, no hace mucho, eh, sí salió la personería jurídica de las mujeres serenas. Eh, las Palides ya tienen su, su asociación desde hace casi 40 años. ¿no? Pero esto es fuera de la cooperativa. Sí, fuera de la cooperativa. Son sindicatos independientes y dentro de las cooperativas, eh, dudo, sí, sí hay una organización, ¿no? Por ejemplo, hay una secretaría de la mujer, ¿no? Ok, espérame un ratito. Ok, so Evelyn tells me that she has found that outside the cooperatives, these women are organizing, a kind of unionizing, uh, both the Serenas and the Palidis. So these are the women who are looking at the, guarding the entrance to the mine and separating the minerals outside the mine. Y me dices que hay otra organización, la tercera, ¿cuál fue? La tercera que sí está dentro de la cooperativa, pero que llega a ser como una secretaría, ¿no? De dentro de la mesa ah. directiva de la cooperativa, que sí es de las mujeres, ¿no? Pero, ah. eh, ajá. Entonces, ahí es como que van y se organizan para cosas ya, eh, eh, no tanto, digamos, para reclamar por los derechos, pero sí para otro tipo de, de cosas, ¿no? Para so, so within, within, perdón. Within the cooperative, she has found that women are organizing, but it's a more formal organization, kind of a ministry within the cooperative. And it's not so much to claim their rights, but to, uh, es para poner reglas? Sí, para, para hacer algunas actividades internas, traen talleres de, no sé, de empoderamiento, de, de oratoria, de otras cosas. So, so they're organizing actually uh, workshops within these organizations. They can be uh, public speaking workshops or other type of workshops within the cooperatives. Okay. Sí, sin embargo, eso lo investigué un poco con la con el, la revisión de archivo y bibliografía, eh, pero mi trabajo en sí ha estado concentrado en la memoria e historia oral, ¿no? Es decir, que yo, yo he podido acceder a 21 entrevistas de 21 mujeres mineras de, de diferentes eh, sectores, ¿no? Eh, de, de, de ser, pero concentrado en el Cerro Rico de Potosí. Y ellas okay. es como que también me han comentado un poco de la experiencia que tenían dentro de sus organizaciones, ¿no? So, so even though she has found all these organizations within and with, uh, outside the cooperatives, her main focus has been in the historical record. And most of this historical record that she's been working with has been an oral record. So she's conducting interviews and she's interviewed 21 mujeres, ¿me dijiste? Sí, así es. 21 women. And she's uh, creating this or putting it in writing, all this oral record that she has found of mining women. Sí, gracias, Evelyn. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, Olga has an interesting question here. I'm interested to know if Evelyn or Oba have information about mining and health, especially for women. Who'd like to answer that? Thank you, Olga. Yes, thanks, Oha. Um, so, I th for my participants, they sort of touched on it. And so I can share a few of the insights that were shared. So most of them mentioned that once they fall pregnant, they mention it to their superior and they are taken off um, production. And then, you know, they, they work on light duties, as it was called. So that usually is to protect mother and baby. And usually um, they are not allowed to go underground until they have um, a certification from a doctor that confirms that they're in good position to go back. But I do remember some of the excerpts from the interview where one was talking about going through CS. And she, so just to give you a bit of context, I did my um, the data collection at the height of COVID, so I didn't have the chance to be at the mine itself. So one talked about having gone through CES and having to tie um, a rope of a sort around the waist, 
which helps them to move, um, I think, climb some ropes or whatnot. And I could only imagine the kind of pain as she, you know, recalled it. So I think for me, um, in as much as, yes, these organizations are taking steps to ensure that the health of mother and baby are sort of protected, I think that there's just so much the organizations can do um, just because of the, the time that it, it takes for a woman to be fully healed, or should I say, um, be back to prenatal, you know, state. So it becomes a bit of a difficult place to be, whether to then tell the women to stay off just because of their health, um, you know, to be fully okay, and whatever that means. So I think it, it became one of those very difficult points of conversation to establish very clear lines. So I think it was always going to be um, whenever you get that certification from the doctor that you're okay, then you go back. And I think that there's also very, there are also very important conversations around well-being generally. So I think when it comes to, for example, access to sanitary facilities underground, very little to talk about. And you could see the disgust with which, you know, some of the women described their conditions. So I think that organizations are becoming a bit more responsive because Again, there's been a particular way they've done or organized the, the workplace to suit men. But now that women are getting into that space, they are becoming a bit more responsive to um, these issues. So that will be as far as I went with um, mining and health for women. Thank you, Oba. Uh, we are cl coming close to saying goodbye to, uh, to you all. Uh, would would uh, Evelyn like to respond to the her in uh, into the her insight on the health issue? Te gustaría decir algo sobre el tema de salud? Sí, sí, eh, sí. Eh, creo que ya en Bolivia eh, en sí es un problema, no, el tema el acceso a la salud digna a nivel nacional. Cuando hablamos de, del mundo minero, eh, he podido identificar que si bien se han eh, instalado algunas postas sanitarias cerca al Cerro Rico, eh, han sido como que un poco tardías, ¿no? Tengo, tengo algunos datos que ya desde los 80 se, se, se instalaron cerca a estos lugares, ¿no? Eh, a mí me ha sorprendido mucho que en el testimonio de muchas mujeres mineras eh, han, han tenido a sus bebés eh, en sus casas, ¿no? Okay. Que, eh, ellas, ajá. So, so, Evelyn has found uh, in records that there have been I mean, in general, the health system in Bolivia is a bit lagging, but she has found in records that there have been health posts close to mining operations since the 80s. But she has been surprised to find that many mining women have given birth in their homes. Sí. Sí. Eh, y además, eh, he notado también en sus historias que que también eso depende mucho de lo que es la condición de clase social. ¿No? Como hace rato te comentaba, eh, hay una jerarquía también dentro de lo que son la, las trabajadoras mineras. Entonces, eh, mientras más recursos tiene, entonces tiene mucho más acceso a la salud. Mientras menos recursos tiene, es mucho más complicado ese acceso a la salud. ¿no? Y, so y that, eso... that, that those different tiers among the mining women, of course, also impact their access to health uh, resources. Uh, the ones that are better off have better access to improved health resources. Sí, continúa, perdón. Gracias, Vivian. Y, y bueno, entonces, a partir de esta categorización, creo que eh, depende, ¿no? El acceso a la salud. A mí me sorprendió mucho en, en, sus, en sus testimonios eh, que, que en el, llegando al mundo minero seguía, eh, estaba muy relacionado con toda la historia. ¿Por, por, qué, ¿Por qué digo esto? Porque las mujeres mineras, eh, la mayoría son migrantes de áreas rurales del departamento de Potosí o también de Bolivia. Y en sus mismas áreas rurales, ellas eh, tenían acceso a la salud, pero a una salud tradicional, ¿no? No era eh, un, un hospital, por ejemplo, sino a, hay muchas ma matronas, se llaman las parteras, ¿no? Matronas, parteras o médicos naturistas, que sí ellas tenían acceso a eso. Pero so llegando she, she a ser un eh, eh, esto se va perdiendo. Uh -huh. Perdón, she has discovered that many of these mining women are migrants. They come from rural 
uh, areas of Bolivia. In those rural areas, they did have access to more modest health systems, uh, basically midwives who assisted in their birth of their children. Sí, perdón. Eh, sí, está muy bien. Esa es prácticamente la, la diferenciación que puedo hacer. Gracias, Vivian. So okay. that's, that's the main differentiation that she makes among women. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, and I think we need to say goodbye and be sure there'll be another make talk and we will all meet again. We've been traveling today into Bolivia and to Ghana and to South Africa. And I see uh, Anna, one of our uh, audience, she says it's very hot in Cape Town. Yep, it is very hot in Cape Town at the moment. Thank you. And I want to have a special thanks to uh, Priscilla for doing the research, finding, she was mining to find our diamonds and we got them. And Vivian, thank you so much that we can always depend on you to give a very nice and a very explanatory uh, translation. Thank you ever so much. Each one of you, thank you ever so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It was great. It was very enlightening. And I think it's lovely to know that our grantees really make a difference in this world. To all of you. Thanks a lot. Gracias, Evelyn. Thank you, Abba. Muchas gracias a, a todos y todas. Un saludo. Gracias. Bye.